How are you? Can I get you a cup of tea? What is your name? Do you have children? What is your favorite bird? Okay, maybe I'm the only one who asked that question. <laughs> you just mean as people. Like, oh, what holidays do you have? Mm -hmm. Simple kinds of stuff. And many times people ask me, how come every time my synagogue has one of these interfaith encounters, it stays superficial? You know, we had one with the Hindu community last year, but it was so superficial. And then next year we're having one with the Muslim community, and we're worried that that would be superficial. Of course it's superficial. It's the first stage. You're just meeting and greeting. You didn't do it wrong. You did it right. Over time, should circumstances and will allow it, you can begin to inquire more deeply. Learn more. Ask harder questions. And inevitably, you don't have to do anything to make this happen. Once you start inquiring more deeply, and sometimes inquiring more deeply is you're doing something together. It's a social action project, perhaps. That's a very popular way to do things together from different backgrounds. It's just going to come up as the relationships develop that you can go more deeply. Inevitably, you will be led to share not only the easy parts, but also the difficult parts. It happened inevitably in my Native Ministries consortium class on religious pluralism. We had a major meltdown in the middle of the week. And the students were upset. Everybody needed counseling. Should they drop out? Is this the right school? Why do the indigenous people hate me? He said, hey guys, remember we talked about this on the first day? We are sharing the difficult parts. We're doing it right. We're not doing it wrong. You move beyond safety territory. And if you stay in conversation or communication, you do move through it. We can't predict if it's going to be two hours or two weeks or two years. If you stay with it, you move through it. And we're talking about in this activity of relationship. And the last stage, the hardest stage, they say, is exploring spiritual practices from other traditions. Sometimes people read this and they say, what? That's the easiest thing in the world. Why, I went to services at the Anglican Church on Christmas Eve. But that's because when they say exploring spiritual practices from other traditions, they mean what Francis Clooney means by comparative theology. Exploring spiritual practices from other traditions, being willing to be addressed by the deity in the forms of other religious traditions. And to copy Warren, who like in this morning's workshop, liked to translate so many terms into familiar Jewish concepts. If you have a narrow mindset, it might well look like a Bodhisattva. Everyone has their boundaries, I, that's for sure. Everyone has the things they aren't willing to do. And they, the three amigos say, if you enter into this with an open heart, your boundaries are going to move in ways that you cannot predict. Because you do not know what is going to address you in what form. And Clooney says, it can happen and you don't convert. And the amigos say, who knows what will happen? It is a risk. But all of the theorists here think that it is the most amazing risk that deepens your spiritual practice, your network of contacts, and your ability to really be different and make it different difference in the sphere that is like your life and your sphere of influence. Yes. 
choices of ways to, to proceed. Shall I ask that first, or do you want to start? I just have a, a quick definition Please. question. So I've gotten some responses from Jewish leaders that bristle or are confused by the word ecumenism. Yes. So I just, could you speak to, is it is it beginning to leak over into, be, it obviously it's leaking beyond the Christian conversation. It, 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 are we correct in expanding its boundaries? Yeah, so people, the reason why, or one of the reasons why, I can't speak for everyone, one of the reasons why uh, people outside of Christian circles don't like ecumenism is because the term right, most popularly refers to right, exchange and sometimes communion that is shared resources and ministers between Christian churches. And naturally, that's what Fox picked because beginning with ecumenism, he was trying to expand ecumenism. And sometimes people feel that that is going to subtly draw us into a kind of religious colonialism, and we're going to start thinking of Christian categories. And again, people may have other reasons for this. But you're, you're feeling comfortable with that, moving the, the definition of ecumenism to a larger sphere? Uh, yeah, I'm comfortable with okay. that. I'm just not comfortable with us calling every interfaith thing we do deep ecumenism. Okay. As I understand it, shallow. what he means by deep is that it's not just about, and others can correct me if my summary is not good. What I think he means by deep ecumenism is we don't just mean sitting in meetings and agreeing that we're not going to defame one another. What we mean is really looking at the way that all of our practices are informed by a deep vibration of divinity and possibility that beats through everything. And in Fox's own writings, he calls it the cosmic quest. <coughs> And so if you are a Jewish reader who is triggered by words like Christ, and I am hardly triggered by the word Christ, even though I have to say it at work every day, I'm hardly triggered by it because in my mind, the next word after it is killer. Um, then you won't like what he says. You'll shut down in the third paragraph. But if you're willing to understand that that's his way of taking a narrow, cultural definition of Christ and saying, but spirit is so much more than that, then you can begin to open to his use of that language. Right. It builds on the work of deep ecology. So there was a shift in the 70s uh, into deep ecology, which meant really going down into the smallest little interconnectedness of the organisms. And I think that's where Fox pulled that, the depth, the deep word. Well, our green. And he talks, our green talks about it. Yeah, yeah, okay. There you go. Mm -hmm. Reb Arthur, which way do you think it is? Oh. Just historical order. Ecumenism <laughs> first or ecology first? Who used D? Do you know? I have the uh, universal answer. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? For no one owns the word D. There you go. We can <laughs> all be D. Be D. <laughs> Sammy? No, Shepard seemed to it off and on. I wonder whether, you know, with Salmandar, Matthew Fox, whether the idea of adding that prefix might not be harking a little after Jung and calling his work dem psychology. Yeah. Love it. Dem psychology. Love it. Yeah. Yeah. That fits beautifully because, well, in the view, hang on, that fits beautifully, whether it was an intention or not, it fits beautifully because one of the esoteric secrets of Jungian psychology is that the psyche is identical with divinity. We just don't usually access enough of our own psyche to recognize that. Mm -hmm. Hannah? No, Elliot. Oh, okay, Elliot. I, 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 I can pass. Victor. I think in, when you read um, Fox's book, um, One River, Many Wells, you get 
the clear impression, that's all it is, that the deep is referring to the both the river and the wells, and that there's a depth to the wells that continually is able to feed the deepening river. Yeah, that's beautiful, and that even deepens his metaphor of the river and the wells. Beautiful. Yeah. Arthur, please. So Zalman's metaphor, which I also like better, raises a really interesting question. If you think about it, which he also often did, not as the body of Gaia, but the body of any human or any mammal, or I suppose any plant as well, then the difference in the organs is a result of the unfolding from what is a unit for that body, a universal DNA. So there is this deep, in that case, I think, deep unity, that sea or whatever, that well, which uh, is, pos is hinted at by Zalman's using the multi-organic, uh, multi multi-organ uh, thing. And that raises the really interesting question. Does it avoid or not? I mean, is that then using the language of science as a religious, a spiritual language in a powerful way? Does it help us get across the different uh, official religious traditions? Or is it simply another one which we, all right. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. And they all have to be open questions because each one of these ways, I'll call them your second one, each one of these ways of speaking about interfaith, encounter, journey, theology is a partial description. Many of them are based in metaphors. And every metaphor has the fabulous virtue that it turns your eyes and mind in a different direction and you see from a new angle. But every metaphor also has the unfortunate problem that it only goes so far before it gets ridiculous and doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. So asking these questions is definitely a part of like, that process. Thank you. Lex? Yeah, um, I, I really appreciated the conversation about the word of humanism and some of the problems that we might see. I, I wanted to just flag, since we're talking about interreligious colonialism, that um, uh, this is my personal view, and I've talked to some others that share it with me. I, I think the term interfaith itself is actually, um, uh, we, we look at it as a neutral term, but I think it's actually the result of some colonialism. Because yeah. it implies that religions are faiths. Mm -hmm. And Christianity, of course, more than almost any other tradition, thinks of itself as a faith. Yeah. And, and, and they, they didn't mean anything harmful in utilizing the term interfaith, but I do think it's important to flag that for a lot of people, whether it's Jews or other religions, mm -hmm. um, faith is not what we're doing when we're doing Jewish. Um, and so I've actually started to avoid that term. I mean, we're problematizing yeah. all the terms, which is good. Um, but I, I just wanted to reflect. Yeah, can I add to that? Sure. Because that raises a number of beliefs. Some people prefer the term multi-faith, because interfaith right, assumes already that there is a commonality to the theology before anybody even finds out anything about one another, and multi-faith at least says, okay, we're coming from different perspectives, who knows where we'll go. But uh, what you're saying is also a really important point that I'd like to make, though I wasn't planning to make, about some of the differences between the Canadian conception of freedom of religion and the American conception of freedom of religion. And there are uh, things that are really interesting to bring into the American environment. You know, in the United States, people don't do this anymore, but people used to talk about multiculturalism in the United States as kind of a melting pot. We were all thrown in together, we learn from one another, we develop sort of this distinct, uh, distinctive American meld of things which hasn't quite happened in the way of the pro-melting pot idealists have hoped. But in Canada, we like to use the salad metaphor. You throw the pieces together, 
it does become some unified new culinary creation, but each thing remains oh, wow. what so it was. Cool. Let me just finish. <laughs> and exactly what this is going to look like is being tested in case law in a variety of cases around the country. The most famous ones mostly focus on things like what we in there. It's facetious. But what we began to realize was when you say, well, keep the public sphere neutral, what we really mean is, we'll Christian. keep the public sphere Christian. Uh -huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? The, yeah. only, the only traditions whose holidays are legal holidays is Christian. That's right. Because the essence of religion for many Christians is faith. We'll just all agree, this is the John Locke thing up at the beginning, that we will tolerate anybody's inner faith as long as they behave a certain way in the public sphere. And as right, immigration from around the world increased in Canada over the last six decades, there are people for whom, as Lex is pointing out, religious practice is not just faith, it's also what you do. It's what you do on Saturday, it's what you do on Sunday, it's what you eat, it's what you wear. It is really important not to go out without your turban, for example. Famous case in Canada, could a member of the RCMP wear his turban instead of the famous RCMP hat? <coughs> he is a Sikh and wears a turban all the time. The answer turned out to be yes. It was one of the big cases that opened the door. And so we're just asking, what is it going to look like for everyone to live together and practice in their distinctive ways and still have civic peace? It's a huge question. Uh, Oren, and then George, and then Lori, and then Olivia Tanjik. A few years ago, my, my PhD supervisor mentioned that there were studies that showed that Perhaps surprisingly, liberal Christianity is a lot more prone to anti-Semitism than Catholicism. Uh, and the reason for that is this John Locke assumption, basically. <coughs> once you, that religion is a matter of private conscience, basically. So if you do not agree with this, and Ju traditional Judaism at least sees itself as a legal system, not to mention Islam, which sees itself as a political system as well, if you do not fall, if you do not accept this premise, it is just fine not to only exclude, exclude you from the public sphere, but also to hate you. So there is some danger in adapting this very, very Protestant view to religion. Not only the public sphere, but in general. Yeah. Not to mention Locke said, we'll tolerate everybody, we're not too sure of so we'll, 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 we'll tolerate everybody? What are we saying? We'll tolerate everybody, but we're not too sure about atheists. No, I was just, I was just like thinking of the model of the salad. It's, um, and um, while I suppose from a political point of view, from a pluralistic point of view, it's important to think this way, but, you know, we, we are never what we were. I mean, you know, that tomato is not the same tomato it was. Before, before we came to the new world, before we came to America or Canada or Australia or other places. So I think that, you know, there's also the problem that I'm having on a certain level is that we are always evolving, we're always changing. And, um, you know, to, to just, when, when you get into these interfaith dialogues and it's George the Jew and Chris the Christian and all sitting there representing our faiths, I mean, it, you know, our faiths are always evolving, they're always changing and that interaction, that interaction is changing us. So that's the only thing that concerns me, that we become, in a sense, too dogmatic about who we are and where we come from, and not open to the possibility of, I uh, forgot the name of the man, the Jesuit priest, who was able to receive some sort of message from the goddess, you know, and incorporate that. So I don't know. I, I mean, um, I have a question about ethical engagement. Mm -hmm. So when um, Willie Ermine mm -hmm. is you know, you gave the example of him uh, asking anybody to take off their shoes. Yeah, that's not a great example because it isn't really the concept that he's talking about. Okay. So I guess what I'm wondering is when he is working with others to plan an event, mm -hmm. um, does does he just embody, try to embody ethical engagement and see what happens? You may not know this. Or does he say, you know, this is how I'd like us to proceed? How, how would that be? Let me give you more context since you're a lawyer. This will make sense to you. Uh, one of 
one of the questions is, to what extent do indigenous communities in Canada want to be self-governing? To what extent does the Canadian government want them to be self-governing? And thus, what should be the rights of indigenous people? What rights should the bands have uh, to hold land? What rights should they have to dispose of them? What rights should they have to profit off them? Who's responsible for the social services? Like really practical <coughs> kinds of questions that have been going round and round for 150 or 200 years. And Ermine says, one of the reasons why the conversation keeps stalling is because you keep talking about rights and you keep talking about land ownership. Mm -hmm. And that is not how our small local bands govern themselves. Mm -hmm. So before we start talking about rights, could you please find out how we actually used to live before you came here? Mm -hmm. And structure the conversation about that. Mm -hmm. So what he's advocating is not just a one meeting, but a several year process of decision makers and policy people getting together to understand the subject before they try to solve the problems. And he says that can also be exported to other kinds of <coughs> practices and dynamics. So does that help? It does a yeah. lot. Thank you. Great. Um, David, and I'm going to be the last one, I should tell you. Uh, one thing is about. Um, I was wondering how to play in uh, Moses Mendelssohn into this. Uh, oh, you figured it out. Uh, uh, no, I'm not going to. I'm, I'm just, that's just a footnote, right? Let's just note that on and we'll play with it some other time. Um, in our um, Gila Community Synagogue is in kind of a, an alliance with the Pre uh, Montclair Presbyterian Church and the Islamic Cultural Center in Northern California. We've been doing these things for about 11 years. One of the things we played with was going beyond tolerance, and so the teaching that we were doing, where each of us had to bring in um, a, um, a document from our religious background that was a good example of our religion's intolerance, rather than starting with, look at how tolerant we are, let's go ahead and, and confess up to the actual reality of our intolerance. Uh, another, um, and then, and then to look at how we have to engage with that. The other one also was um, in a smaller group discussion, uh, our uh, problems with the uh, fanatics of our own faith, mm -hmm. and uh, what it was like for us to have to deal with these other folks that call themselves by the same name, but who had a very different relationship to um, looking at. You know, it, it, a different relationship to tolerance and intolerance within the thing. And all of those discussions really brought up some very interesting things. Yeah, absolutely. We did that in our third weekend of the advanced integrating seminar, blah, blah, on indigenous wow. and religious studies, because we needed a group that was the class to be a group first before they could say, you know, I'm no longer here as a representative of my tradition. I'm just a part of this group. Mm -hmm. Do you want to say one thing that it brought up? Uh, Without well, transgressing the boundaries of... There was um, a common sense of, of, um, of embarrassment. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, um, and also a common sense of why am I being put into the position of showing that we're not all... Um, <coughs> You know, uh, settlers on the West Bank, we're not all Taliban, and we're not all, um, uh, you know, Christian uh, uh, fundamentalists. I mean, so there was, and, and um, why do I have to prove that I'm a good Jew? Why do I have to prove that I'm one of the good Muslims? Why do I have to prove that I'm one of the good Christians? Uh, that, that kind of thing uh, came up. Uh, and just on Mendelssohn, I mean, he's really the, one of the first of the Jews who has to show that uh, universal religion should not be considered to be a Christianity, uh, and then why, why considered given to how be Christianity, modernity, yeah, and why given uh, modernity, uh, I still remain a Jew, uh, and that's 1780s, uh, 1770s that he's he's trying to approach this issue. I'm not sure we're going. 
Yeah, I was still working on it. Very cool. Very nice. Yeah, it reminds me of um, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. Before I had to teach in the Native Ministry Summer School, I sat in on the first book of Summer School, so I had some idea of what the dynamic was about. And I sat in on a course called, what's it called? I don't know, Indigenous Theologies or Hermeneutical Theology and Indigenous Approach. But it was really just all about academic and intellectual colonialism. And at the end of the week, I didn't know that this was on the list of questions you're not supposed to ask. So I asked everybody in the group when it was my turn to speak, why are you still Christian? <laughs> but their answer is, you know, so much has been taken away from us. You gave us Christianity three generations ago. Don't try to take that away from us too. And, you know, that is the association I make, David, when you talk about proving why I'm still a Jew. Even in these times, there are such deep associations with that, that not everyone has with their tradition, but many people have with their tradition. And that's one of the things that makes everything that's described here so much more difficult in real life than on paper. Not to mention the constant feeling of failure we have in interfaith dialogue because we have not brought about world peace through our six series dialogue for learning. <laughs> but I don't think we should give up hope because you know that Margaret Mead quote that says, you know, that's yeah, right. Doubt. Don't it, that a small group of concerned citizens can change the world? Because in fact, that is the only thing that has ever changed the world. And if you put that together with one of all of our favorite sayings of knowledge, whoever saves one life, it's as if they saved an entire world. If you have uplifted one small community, you have made a huge we need to stop because our time is up. And the next event is at 4.30. But I encourage you to download the handout from the conference website. Not only does it have notes on this, but it's got a cool text from Reb Nachman and three different Jewish perspectives on the multi-faith encounter. Thank you so much. Thank you.